Good afternoon, and welcome to the Kansas City Public Library's online series of signature events. We're doing something a little different today. We're bringing you a literary lunch break. Dr. Shelley Klein, the Director of Education and Historian for the Midwest Center for Holocaust Education, is here to give us some background on a classic work of Holocaust literature, Survival in Auschwitz by Primo Levi, a fitting work to discuss today on International Holocaust Remembrance Day. This book serves as a focal point in the uh, serves as a focal point in the current exhibit at Union Station, Auschwitz, not long ago, not far away. The Midwest Center for Holocaust Education will be hosting a more in-depth book discussion of survival in Auschwitz on February 10th at 6:30 in the evening. Please visit their website, it's in the chat, to register for the link to the Zoom event. The library has multiple copies to check out, or you can purchase purchase a copy from your favorite online bookseller. Today, we hope to pique your interest in reading Primo Levi's memoir. So think of our conversation as a verbal, visual reader's guide. Our guest, Dr. Klein, holds a PhD from KU and has served on the faculties of Kansas City Art Institute and UMKC. Her research focuses on the SS Officer Herinen in the concentration camp system and the gendered perpetration of the Holocaust. Welcome, Shelley, and thanks for sharing your lunch break with us. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. Um, before we get started, uh, I'd like to share just a little bit of background on um, Primo Levi's uh, The Auschwitz that he came to. So this is a book that many of you maybe have heard of before. Um, hopefully, you're, you've certainly heard his name. If you've been to the Auschwitz exhibit, you will you'll recognize him. Uh, and so one thing I think is important, we often think about Auschwitz, but there are a few details that I think would be helpful for all of us as we go into this conversation. So let me quickly share my screen and we will get started. I'm glad you're bringing that you're bringing that up, Shelley, because I, I must admit that Primo Levi's name is one that I know only in association with his Holocaust experiences. but. He seems to be far more important than that. So I'm glad you're gonna give us a broader picture of the man and his background. Right, and I think that, you know, one reason why we wanted to encourage people to read this particular book is, it's one of those that you you hear of, you know of, but it's another thing to really sit down and read it cover to cover. Um, and that can give you a, a much richer experience than just perhaps a quote here and there, but certainly the quotes that the uh, Union Station exhibit gives us uh, are a nice starting point, and we can talk about some of those as we go on. Um, firstly, I just wanted to throw up a few of the covers here, um, because this is a book that has been in publication since 1947. It was first published under the title, If This Be a Man, in Italian. Um, and in many ways, I think that's a much more compelling title um, than the eventual English, you know, survival in Auschwitz. Um, so just keep, if I, when I read it, I like to think that the intended title is If This Be a Man. Just a few details. Uh, again, we all know it's survival in Auschwitz, right? But which Auschwitz? Many of you may know uh, that Auschwitz was three, had three distinct camps, and there were lots of subcamps that were associated with it. Um, we have the original Auschwitz I camp. Uh, then there was Auschwitz II, which we know is Birkenau. This is the death camp that most people think of when they think of Auschwitz. And then we have the IG Farben slave labor camp of Bunamanovitz, and that's the section that um, Primo Levi was in. So he was working at that IG Farben um, slave labor complex there. And just so you can see this map geographically, you can see how um, separate they, they all are within this complex. Very quickly, thinking about the numbers of people deported to Auschwitz, we know about a you know just over a million uh, Jews were deported there. There's other groups as well that end up in Auschwitz, and then along with those numbers, looking at the mortality rates of those who went there. So there's a 91% mortality rate of Jews who went to Auschwitz, um, and then somewhat surprisingly, uh, if we think about Soviet POWs who were among some of the first victims, their mortality rate was 99%. Um, so again, other groups there, smaller numbers, um, but definitely there's there's a, a lot of different groups here in Auschwitz. And lastly, we think about Primo Levi as being Italian. So how is it that an Italian Jewish person ends up in Auschwitz? 
Um, there are six different death camps in the Nazi system. There's over 44,000 concentration camps in the Nazi system during its 12 year period, but only six of those are death camps with mass killing facilities whose purpose was, you know, mostly death. Those other camps, uh, the other five most, you know, they got a lot of, you know, Polish Jews, Jews from Eastern Europe. It's Auschwitz that gets the international population. So the Jews from Western Europe um, and Southern Europe are the ones that end up in Auschwitz. So I just wanted you to quickly see some numbers here to show you just how very international the character of the population of Auschwitz was. And consequently, the survivor popula population of Auschwitz tends to be quite international as well. Very, very quickly, I just want to let us know too that Auschwitz develops over time. So it isn't, you know, the death camp that we mostly think of it. It isn't even just the slave labor complex that um, Primo Levi is in. The first Auschwitz is developed in 1940. This is that um, mostly Soviet prisoners and other perceived enemies of the Reich go there. This is a small camp. Um, things are expanded in 1941 so that the place where Primo Levi does end up, Buna Camp, that is started. Uh, because a German company named IG Farben is interested in building a massive factory, one of the biggest um, in the Reich, um, to produce synthetic rubber and some other things. So they they begin this expansion there in 41. And then we'll also see expansion at Birkenau, which is initially intended for Soviet POWs. We know it, though, as the place where once policy changes, that's where um, the Jews were primarily sent. And this was the death camp um, portion. And it's only in 1943 that that section of Birkenau um, gets the industrial crematorium gas chamber combos that we are most familiar with when we think of the industrial killing in Auschwitz. So just to keep in mind, this takes time. Um, it doesn't happen overnight. There's all these different iterations of Auschwitz. And then finally, Primo Levi will arrive in Auschwitz in February of 1944. Um, when and if, hopefully, you, you read the book, um, it does open with this poem that Primo Levi writes called If This Be a Man. Um, and so he's you know reflecting on um, the conditions of, of people in the camp and what this means in this particular place. So uh, it's, a, it's a powerful piece. And again, going forward with you know, when you read the work to think about that being the, the true tridal and, and the premise. So just some quick background there to give you um, to know where you're situated and to know which part of Auschwitz we're talking about, because it's very easy to assume it's all the same thing and that he's speaking about Birkenau because that's more of a typical assumption. In fact, he's, he's speaking about a slave labor complex within it. That's that map was overpowering. All I could think was, what is the acreage there? That that map looks the the map of the camp looked like the size of a small city, Shelley. And it really, I mean, Birkenau is about 175 acres. So um, Birkenau is quite large. It was the largest. The others are, you know, smaller in comparison. Um, but yes, this is definitely the, these places were the size of of, of small cities for sure. And, and going back to Primo Levi's memoir, it holds a pretty significant place in the Holocaust literary canon, doesn't it? Can you tell us a little bit about that? And, and why do we remember this particular memoir? Um, I know there are, there are so many. I found so many on the list, that uh, the resource list that the library created to go along with this event. Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, and there are, you know, in our world today, there are so many Holocaust memoirs. So it's hard to think of a time when barely any existed. And so if we go back to the end of the war, um, in the years immediately following, Primo Levi writes this almost immediately after, after the war. And he takes his, his first manuscript to a publisher in 1946. I think he actually takes it to six publishers and was rejected. Eventually he gets it published in 1947. But that run, that publication has about 2,000 copies. So it's a small run. It also isn't widely read. Most of those copies end up in a storage facility in Florence uh, that sit there for over 20 years. And most of them are damaged in the great flood that Florence has almost 20 years later. Um, so there, the, the point is, in these initial years, there isn't an appetite. There isn't an audience for this sort of thing. And so you know, for survivors who went through it, some of them want to tell, but in many cases, there's no one to listen. And many of them aren't ready to tell. They, you know, it's too much. It's too difficult. For those who who do have the impulse, and, you know, Primo Levi starts his book by saying, I'm writing this out of an urgency. I need to say this. 
Um, and I think that's an important thing to keep in mind as you read it. Like there, there is an urgency here and he is communicating his experience very freshly. And that's different from a memoir that you might read that was written in the 80s or the 90s. He's writing this when it was really fresh, both in his memory and his experience, but also in what he knew about the Holocaust. So we don't have a lot of knowledge in terms of the scope and how it was put together when he's writing this. So that's a, you know, an interesting thing to keep in mind. Uh, so there isn't a lot of an audience for it right away. And it, there's a second publication in 1958, and finally in 1959, it's published in English. So it gets a bit more of a readership then, um, but it's really in the 80s that it becomes widely read and popular. And this also has to do with Holocaust historiography. You know, I mentioned there wasn't an audience initially, and it takes some time. Um, in the 60s, we start to see another um, sort of wave of interest in, in Holocaust memoirs and survivors. And that has to do with the uh, Eichmann trial. So when um, Adolf Eichmann was captured by the Israelis and put on trial, that trial was televised and survivors were put on the stand and they told their stories. Uh, and it was one of the first times that publicly people could, you know, they could turn on their TVs, they in their living rooms were the stories of Holocaust survivors. So you start to see in the 60s, a, a, a bit of a wave of interest. Um, and then that that keeps growing as the world becomes ready. Um, but because his was you know, written early, it's there, it's sort of been around, people were taking pieces of it and quotes from it. It's written early, uh, just like Knight is written early. Um, but it's interesting because you, these, you know, we think of these as the sort of standard Holocaust memoirs. Um, there's another very good memoir that we, uh, we promoted last spring called Smoke Over Birkenau written by a woman who was also an Italian, who was also a Jewish partisan, just like Primo Levi. Um, and it's interesting to see their parallel, like how parallel they were, but she's telling a women's story and the women's story doesn't get translated into English nearly as soon. The women's story isn't picked up and it's not seen as the universal story of the Holocaust. And so um, in many ways we see Primo Levi and in some ways, you know, Knight as well, slipping into this um, this space. Once there was space and an appetite for Holocaust memoirs, these early ones, um, slip in and become sort of the standards. And they're, you know, there's good. And obviously I'm, I'm, I'm recommending them. Um, but as with anything, we have to think about that place uh, and and where they, where we've gone from there. And they've stood the, these three memoirs have stood the test of time because of the, the literary quality to the writing as well and the compelling way all three tell their stories. Right, and I think that's a really important thing to draw in this particular memoir. The writing is very good. Um, you know, the, it's a good translation. It's It holds up in translation, absolutely. And one thing that Primo Levi is very focused on is language. Um, and he mentions specifically in a number of places the failure of language to capture this event. Um, and I think that, again, this isn't just a, a recording of, you know, terrible things that happened to this person. He's trying to... Uh, make sense of it in the moment. He's trying to connect it to a larger, you know, Western tradition of literature that he's educated in and familiar with and trying to use that to, to make what he experienced understandable to an audience. I was struck by the way Primo Levi crafts, the, crafts his story. It's uh, these small bites, these small chapters so if a reader does start to feel overwhelmed and needs to put the book aside, you won't feel as if you're leaving in the middle of something or, or tearing your attention away in such a manner that would make you feel as if you're disrespecting the voice of the author. And in many ways, you could um, pick up, you know, you could just read an individual chapter or two, um, you know, in some ways as they can, they can be very standalone which is nice because it's, it's you know, these usable pieces. It can be, you know, good for fast reading if that's what you need. But it also reminds us too that as with anyone's life, it doesn't happen, like none of our lives or events in our life fit neatly into a sequential, you know, package. And so it's, you know, this book and, you know, the book I talked about earlier, Smoke Over Birkenau, fit into those categories where you can, you can pull out these pieces. And in some ways, pulling out the pieces if you did that, can in many ways more adequately reflect the chaos of their experience. 
I was struck by uh, by Primo Levi's his writing is it is so clear it's accessible and it's and it's compelling and then when I'm doing a little more background research there's so much focus on his education studying chemistry how did he come to be known for the literary arts as a novelist a memoirist a poet and he gets his start in education studying chemistry did he does he meld them together or does he just have two genius brains you know i think this also is reflective of a you know a european education of his time where you know he was trained as a scientist and in chemistry but he was also broadly read i mean in this book he'll reference you ulysses and dante like this is a man who's read the western canon um, and so I think that because he was familiar with this vast literary tradition, he's able to bring that into his account. And I think that's a really important thing to think about when you're reading this, that he's writing, when he experiences Auschwitz, he's an educated adult in his 20s, which is very different than, say, Elie Wiesel, who is a teenager, who didn't have you know much of a formal education versus a college-educated um, grown man. And what it means is they bring different aspects to the story. He's trying to make sense of it in a different way than someone who was at a different point in life. We see this also with um, Gisela Pearl, who wrote, uh, I was a doctor in Auschwitz. And she, she too is a, you know, a scientist, a, a medical doctor, and she's able to, to write with, with some of that voice as well. There's an objectivity that she brings to it because of her training. So I think his general education influences his ability to, to transition. And his experience, I think, just demanded of him that he he try and share this experience through literature. And he goes back to, you know, after the war, he goes and works for a paint company. He does that into the 70s, um, mostly out of financial reasons. You know, his his books weren't making enough to make him able to retire off of that. So he he does continue to work in, um, you know, with his with his chemistry knowledge and write in addition to that. It's it's amazing. Yeah, his his writing life was just amazing, um, and and it's his writing life that that it, that the exhibit at Union Station draws on for many of the rooms in that enormous gut wrenching exhibit. Um, where should where should viewers of the exhibit look for quotes from this book, and how did the exhibit use use this book? So it's interesting. I mean, the exhibit, one of its its many strengths is its use of survivor testimony, be it video recording or numerous quotes on the wall. And sometimes these are long quotes. Sometimes these are, you know, quite short. Um, and so for, you know, his quotes are really scattered throughout. They also do a good job of, you know, he isn't the only survivor mentioned by any means. He's he's one of many. Some of the survivors they mention are quite famous. Some of them are mm -hmm. less so. Some of them, I would say, are, are virtually unknown to, to the, the public audience. Um, and so, I mean, there are no, you know, there's many places you you might find a, a short thing from from him. One place that stands out to me is um, there's a section about sort of arrival in Auschwitz, and he talks about, and this is you know from this book, he talks about um, being tattooed and what that means. And um, I can read you; it's a short quote. I can read it to you. You know, he's talking about it's the moment where prisoners come in and their hair is shaved, they're given a uniform, and, and they're tattooed. And so this is him reflecting on it. And this, you get a sense too of his, his writing with this too. And this part isn't in the exhibit, but I'll tell you what it is. He says, imagine a man who is deprived of everyone he loves and at the same time of his house, his habits, his clothes, in short of everything he possesses. He will be a hollow man reduced to suffering and needs, forgetful of dignity and restraint. For he who loses all often easily loses himself. And then he says, and this is in the exhibit, halfling. I have learned I am a halfling. My number is 1714517. We have been baptized and we will carry the tattoo on our left arm until we die. And so he connects that, you know, this physical thing that's happened to him with the psychological trauma that's happening as well. And what I like about where the exhibit positions it is in this entry place, like this, this section of entrance into Auschwitz, but next to it is a sketch from a, a former prisoner and the sketches of women having their hair shaved and they're you know completely naked and so it's showing this juxtaposition too of this experience of women because if you talk to female survivors many of them 
discuss the shame and trauma of having their hair shaved. It's all of their bodily hair is shaved for men too. And they're, they're nude in front of lots of people. And for women, that is the great trauma. For men, who often mention, as Primo Levi does too, the, the nudity and the hair shaving, but for men, it's that loss of name and identity. And he captures that very well in, in this passage in Survival in Auschwitz. And the exhibit does a very nice job of juxtaposing those two same experience for male and female prisoners, but very different remembered trauma. It's a, it was a stunning exhibit. I saw it last October and was, I can't believe I spent five hours in that exhibit. It didn't feel like five hours. It didn't feel, it didn't feel like there was, it's a lot. I'll admit to everyone who's watching this, this exhibit is a lot to take in, but it's arranged in such a way that I never felt completely buried by the exhibit as I was going through. I was able to absorb everything and take my time and my feet weren't sore. I, I didn't feel as if I had stuffed my brain with too much information. It was, it was compelling and moving and, and so human. So all, I really did enjoy the personal stories, the stories of triumph and the stories of loss in that exhibit. And, and they do a nice job too of showing you like pieces of everyday life in Auschwitz. And that's too something that, you know, he speaks about in the book, telling you what a day's work is like and the importance of a soup bowl and, you know, the thinness of a uniform. And so he'll mention many of these pieces. And so if you pair the book with the exhibit, um, you know, if you've been to the exhibit and you read the book, you know exactly what he's talking about because you just saw it. Um, and vice versa, if you read the book and then go see the exhibit, um, you know, it'll only make that exhibit experience richer because you'll have this touchstone of, oh yeah, I mean, I know exactly what this bowl is. I know, um, you know, what these, you know, he talks about, you need shoes that fit, or if you have the wooden clogs, the blisters that they'll cause, and you can see a pair of these clogs and you would think, yes, if I had to work all day in those two, um, what would that do to my feet and, you know, infection and chances of survival? That was, uh, those are the, those are the items, the, the very personal items, the things that we can see every day in our own homes that you see in this exhibit that probably touched me and moved me more than anything else and made me feel connected in some way. So with the, with the book, what are some of the thinking points readers should have in mind as they move through survival in Auschwitz? Well, definitely pay attention to his use of language and his discussion on the failure of language. And once again, I just want to point out a quick thing, because I think, again, this is a good, um, it'll give you a sense of what he's doing. He will talk about, you know, how the words we have don't have the same meaning there. And he's talking about winter coming and the fear that, you know, they have of things getting colder and the little protection they have. And he says, just as hunger is not that feeling of missing a meal, so our way of being cold has a need of a new word. We say hunger, we say tiredness, fear, pain, we say winter, and they're different things. They are free words created and used by free men who live in comfort and suffering in their homes. If the loggers had lasted longer, a new harsh language would have been born, and only this language could express what it means to toil a whole day in the wind. So there's so many gems like that woven into this text. So I think it might be easy when a person first starts it to say, oh, I know the story of Auschwitz. But the point isn't that you, you learn the story of Auschwitz, it's that you get these, these nuggets of analysis of someone who was there trying to make sense of it with the limited language that, that we have available. So pay attention to that. Um, he will talk a lot too about the role of luck um, he's not crediting his survival to anything that he did, uh, certainly not anything like positive that he did. So pay attention to these moments when he just gets lucky, because for many survivors, that is the story of survival. It's, it's a lot of luck. Um, as I said before, he's writing from an adult voice, a male voice, and an educated voice. So think about how those aspects of his personal life impact the narrative that he's bringing to you. Um, he gives us a fairly grim view on human nature, which I think is appropriate given what he's talking about. So to me, 
questions of human nature are the whole reason why I got interested in the Holocaust and why I've you know made it my life's work. Um, and so I think this is this is a great work for examining that you know the darkness of human nature, not just on the part of who's perpetrating it, but on the part of those who are experiencing and what it takes to survive another day. Um, also think about what we knew in 1946 and 47 versus what we know now. So some of the things that he says, and this is true of any memoir, right? They are an expert in their particular slice of their experience, but it doesn't mean that he knew about the grand working plans of the Nazis and the final solution, right? So um, take that into consideration as well. We know a different picture of the Holocaust all of these years later because it's become a, you know, a major field of study. Um, and lastly, he concludes the book by his final chapter is called The Story of 10 Days. And this story of 10 days is the days leading up to liberation. The final day he talks about and he ends the book with is January 27th, which is of course today. On January 27th, that, that is the day that the Soviet troops came into Auschwitz and liberated um, those remaining prisoners. And as many of you might know, there weren't that many prisoners left in Auschwitz when the Soviets came in because most of them had been death marched out by the, the SS ahead of the arriving Soviet army. So not that many are left. Um, and if you read, you'll realize why Primo Levi was, was left there. Uh, why didn't he go on a death march? And it's, you know, the, these last, this picture of these last days is really interesting because it's not one that you typically hear of. Um, what Auschwitz looked like once it's been abandoned by the SS. But on this final day, on this final January 27th that he writes about, it's the moment of liberation, which we typically associate with some sort of euphoria, right? That it's, you know, we have the pictures in our minds of, of survivors just, you know, being so joyous. And of course, many of them felt this moment of, of, of you know, joyous euphoria. But very quickly that passed because as soon as they realized that they were free, they also realized that the people they were surviving to return to were most likely dead and the lives they wanted to get back to were over. And so there is a real sadness that settles in. And I think that, you know, as he recounts this day for us, even, you know, a year later, he recounts the day basically by saying he and one of his friends carried the dead body of one of their other friends out into the snow, dumped it, saw the Russians. His friend lifted his, you know, beret at the Russians. And Primo Levi's final thought on liberation is, I wish I, ha I regret not having a beret. So in many ways, it sort of, it, you know, it leaves the reader with like, what? Like, shouldn't there be more? But there's so much there in what he doesn't give us. Um, but I think it's very appropriate to think about that moment on this particular day, um, as we remember, this is International Holocaust Remembrance Day, um, and it's a moment to not only, you know, reflect on what survivors lost and what it meant to survive, um, but to consider that lasting impact on survivors, how this was always a part of their lives, um, even, you know, decades later, this is still something that complicates their lives. Um, and we should also consider the lasting lessons of the Holocaust in our world today. I'm going to pause for a moment and have a look and see if there are any questions coming in from the viewers. Um, but if not, then I'm, I'm going to ask you to talk a little bit about how do we answer or respond to those people who today might put forth denials that the Holocaust occurred? is a an unfortunately reoccurring topic and in our you know recent years we see shifts in tactics of denial initially it may have been um you know wholesale denial of any of it happening now we see more people denying that there were gas chambers like oh maybe some jews died but not nearly six million and there weren't gas chambers or hitler didn't know all of them are denial all of them are based in anti-semitism um, and so it's really important to understand when you're seeing it and to be able to, to, to recognize it and to call it out as, as being wrong. So it's certainly something that hasn't gone away. Um, and it's, there are many different forms, even if it's simply, you know, equating events in our own time wrongly to, to events in the Holocaust. It's, it's, those are all pieces of a, a much more troubling puzzle. And, and you would say this book is a good entry point to making a human connection to this wider, this wider. Yeah, this is, a, yeah, this is, 
this is a good a good way to to read one man's account of of what he went through, but also to to read someone who's truly grappling with what it meant, what it meant for him to survive, um, what it means about human nature um, to go through something like this. So I think it it personalizes it and it also brings you into it in a way that again makes you think about um deeper questions than just oh this you know this was this was terrible this was sad this is horrific um and i have to say too i mean many people shy away from a holocaust story because they're oh it'll be too sad or oh, it'll be too graphic this isn't graphic i mean it's sad in the way that of course it's about the holocaust and it is dark about human nature but there's nothing graphic um or grotesque about it it's it's definitely a thoughtful account um again trying to convey something that language ultimately fails at thank you so much shelly i'm going to encourage everyone who's watching to pick up a copy of survival in auschwitz we've got copies at the library we please order a copy from your favorite online book retailer RSVP for the more in-depth discussion that will focus just on this work. It's February 10th, it's 6.30 in the evening. It'll all be on Zoom. We'll be safe, we'll be sane, we'll be warm. And you can do that by RSVPing at the Midwest Center for Holocaust Education website. It's right up there. Please take a moment to, to consider visiting the exhibit at Union Station. Shelly, when does that uh, conclude? It's there through March 20th. Okay, so great time folks to look at the, to read the book, discuss the book, and then go visit the exhibit. Oh, and Shelly, we'll conclude with this last uh, audience question. Um, just came in at the last minute. Were all of the leadership positions, um, the block elders, the capos that Levi describes, were they originally prisoners like himself who were promoted in a way? or were there German soldiers stationed at the camp? Good question. So within, there's a, there's a lot of, there's a complicated structure of governance within the camp. Capos and um, block leaders, those are gonna be prisoner positions. And then you have block Führers. Those are, um, it says Führer, then those are, you know, those are SS soldier positions. But there is a combination of prisoner leadership that does get promoted. And oftentimes those capos would be promoted because of, you know, willingness to use force, brutality, that sort of thing. And they would get perks in, in exchange for that sort of thing. Um, but there is, yeah, there is a mixture. Certainly the people with the ultimate power or of co are of course the Nazis. But again, this brings up complicated questions of um, prisoner hierarchies and how prisoners use and abuse each other. We see this in his work with the men's camp. You also see it when you look at the writings of women and how women are very often like they're afraid of sexual assault. And oftentimes it's not just from the Nazis, but it's also from other prisoners, from male prisoners who might be in a position of power. Um, so there's all sorts of complications within this world that we typically think of as being like very black and white, you know, Nazi prisoner. Um, but that of course, isn't the case. It's a great question. And um, certainly, yeah, if you, if you, have more like this, you should definitely join us for our, our discussion on the 10th, because that will just be an, an open discussion of people who have read the book and, and want to hear other people's thoughts on it. It won't be, um, it won't be so much, you know, me talking and really what we want to hear from you. That's, um, and this question also reminded me of one of the more moving pieces in the exhibit. There are, there are several artworks that, that depict um, prisoners who were elevated to promoted to minor positions of power. And I, I'm recalling some of those illustrations, those artworks and feeling, remembering that they were very, uh, that was just a piece of uh, Holocaust literature or Holocaust event that I didn't know about. And it was really amazing to see those artworks displayed in that one exhibit hall in this, in the larger exhibit. So read about it in the book, discuss it in the group, and then this will mean a lot more for those of you who haven't seen the exhibit, especially when you come upon that one that one room that talks about that. So thank you again, Shelley, for sharing your lunch break with us. This has been this has been fascinating deep dive into Primo Levi and survival in Auschwitz. So thank you all so much for joining us. Please make sure you get a copy of the book and you know where to find us if you have questions further.
Thank you all. Enjoy the rest of your day.